Hi, Anaya, I can see you. I'm in my TV studio here. Can you hear me? Can. Can. <laughs> the um, so, yeah, welcome to Anaya Lockwood, who's on all these screens around me, which is a wonderful place to be, surrounded by Anaya. Um, so just to give you an incredibly short introduction of Anaya's uh, very long career. So Anaya Lockwood's been composing and making work since the 1960s, and she's known for her uh, exploration of natural acoustic sounds uh, and the sounds of our environment. So this includes glass compositions through to a big series on recording rivers from their source to their mouth, um, into many works for uh, various instruments, including pre prepared piano and other ones. So today um, we're gonna talk about uh, I think we're going to talk about the piano burning, which is the uh, sort of closing ceremony of Unsound this year. Um, and we're going to talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we're going to have a chance to have some questions from the room. So, uh, and we'll kind of have a microphone that'll go around. So please uh, bring your questions uh, to us. So hi, hi, and I, uh, I'm looking at you for a screen here. This is quite Hello, it's incredibly Jim. futuristic. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds it. <laughs> <laughs> so the closing performance of the festival is a piano burning. So for anyone who hasn't heard of the piano transplants, could you tell us about that series and where it started? It it started in a low uh, a low period in my compositional life when I really was uninspired and had a little upright piano in a flat in London. Um, and it occurred to me that Cage had never been able to take prepared piano to its ultimate lengths, because of course the piano always has to be restored at the end of a performance, but that I could permanently prepare that little piano. So I started playing with it and had a lot of fun with it and ended up in Goldsmiths uh, many, many, many years later. That was the, actually the first piano transplant. And then um, I was talking about a possible performance uh, called Heat with Richard Alston, the British choreographer, uh, which we never really did. But um, in preparing for that and thinking about it, I started recording fire in as many different sorts of circumstances and locations as I could devise. And none of my recordings worked for me. And then Bob Cobbing, was running a festival on the Chelsea Embankment, and Bob Cobbing, a sound poet, uh, and invited me to participate. And it occurred to me that um, a piano, a defunct piano, a piano beyond repair, would might conceivably make amazing sounds while burning, not least from strings popping. So uh, we imported a couple of totally decrepit, un irreparable pianos and set them up in a, a sort of what might have been a, a bomb site that hadn't been reconstructed, perhaps. It was perfect, it was totally safe. And ran, put an old mic in the base of uh, one of the uprights in the afternoon and ran the cable out to a little Uha tape recorder having wrapped it with asbestos. All these things being completely impossible these days, of course, <laughs> yeah. almost all of them. And started recording and the recording was completely useless because, of course, what I should have foreseen but hadn't was that a lot of people gathered around and talked their heads off for at least the first 20 minutes or half an hour, the length of a small reel of tape. <laughs> and, but, but it was visually and, and sonically gorgeous. Um, so we burned another one at night, which was even more beautiful. Um, and then it became... It, you know, it became a, a thing in itself, a piece in itself, and, and people could project all sorts of interpretations onto it, a bit like a Rorschach test. And then I did several other transplants, which have lately been resuscitated. Yeah, I love the idea of you talking about it like a Rorschach test, because I was watching, there's uh, been another recent one, which I think we should talk about the piano transplants that have just happened as part of the Issue Project Room series. Um, but I was watching this one online, 
uh, actually just yesterday. So um, there's just been a series of Anea's work presented for Issue Project Room in New York. And for this, there was a series of all of uh, the piano transplants and there was a piano burning in Australia, was that right, in Brisbane? In Brisbane, And I yes. found myself watching it and doing exactly what you just described, like thinking, wow, this is such a sort of beautiful, like symbolic burning of uh, the Western canon. And that was like my <laughs> reading of it. But then, uh, then realising, oh, there's a million readings of this. But what's, do you have a reading of it? I think I know what your answer to this is going to be, but... <laughs> What do you see personally in a piano burning? Uh, I, I still love to experience, I, I love to experience it on several levels, but predominantly still the absolutely unpredictable visual beauty of the way the flames move through the piano. Uh, in fact, Vanessa Tomlinson, who was playing that piano with what I call real courage in, in Brisbane and stayed at it far longer than I would have dared. I was yelling at her on my screen, get out. <laughs> um, Vanessa uh, played the most wonderful cascade of notes just before flames licked through under the keyboard from the back of the piano where the fire had started, nerve wracking. Um, but I, and I love to hear the sounds which are which are stunning and sometimes the strings pop and sometimes they don't no matter how how much you tighten them uh, i like that unpredictability and then it's always fascinating to me to see how the piano how the framework will eventually fall the the harp the metal very powerful and beautifully constructed metal framework and i love to see how the outer layers of the instrument uh burn away and slowly reveal this harp, which is something that most people never get to see and is often very quite ornate, beautifully decorated and just lovely. So those are the things that fascinate me still. And I, you know, I don't, I, my construction of it is not different. I needed to record fire. It's a very good fire. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, the f piano burnings have had this a uh, very long lifespan in terms of it continues to be a uh, sort of really fascinating and a, an appealing composition. To, it is a composition. Like there was a recording of one on the, that recent album by Clipping, and then there's going to be another one closing the festival. I'm quite interested in this idea of how it, how it continues to be relevant, perhaps because of what you mentioned about the way it is a Rorschach test and a piano is a deeply sort of symbolic instrument for a lot of people or it, it has meaning or memory connected to it. And then fire obviously is, fire is fire. But I want to ask you about the other transplants as well, because uh, we've talked about the permanent, permanently prepared piano, which has the big beautiful lips on it and the piano burning. But um, there's also been a new piano garden and a piano drowning is that right yes uh they they date back uh, the piano garden was something i set up in the garden of a place in ingotstone essex where i was living for a couple two or three years before i came over to america uh, a little grand and two little uprights embedded in shrubbery and the ground uh, and piano drowning was set up in a, a cattle pond on a ranch in Amarillo, Texas in 1972. Uh, and slowly it was a very shallow pond so and with a clay base. So the piano was very slowly sinking. Um, and what interested me in those two and in the piano on the beach, which I've discontinued, but what interested me in all three of the other transplants um, has always been tracing the way what appear to be quite delicate and tender um, natural lives such as plants growing through working their way through the joints and pulling apart the joints of the pianos in the piano garden gradually over time and water just dismembering the piano in the pond in texas over time the the in, insuperable strength of those natural forces working on something as strongly constructed as a piano so the piano garden was set up again wonderfully by dominic chanel and soundlands in wales 
oh, back in, I think, 2013, uh, in, in a sculpture uh, garden set up in a forest, Woodier Forest, uh, with a camera trained on it, which would occasionally capture a fox or a child or a curious passerby, and it looks better and better and better as it matures, so to speak. And uh, now I set up at Caramore near me in Westchester, uh, an arts presentation um, presenter, where it is slowly changing, aided by kids coming and playing on it and so on. And uh, Piano Drowning, Dominic, uh, again, set it up uh, in a lovely pond in Wales, bordering fields and so on. Um, it, the, so far, the piano is about a third of the walk comes about a third of the way up this upright. And uh, Yania Pritchard, uh, a brilliant young Welsh composer, and Senior Pestover Bennett recently brought it to thunderous life in that pond. A wonderful performance of a piece by Yania. I'm really happy. I love that piece. So happy to see these transplants coming back to life. The piano drop, that's only the second iteration of the piano drowning it's got a long life ahead of it in that pond i think yeah de de uh, definitely a lot of life in it and i think that's really key to these performances and uh, and sort of the these almost like dur their sort of durational compositions and mm. i wonder if you can speak to the idea of of time and if that's a how integral that is to you as thinking as a composer and thinking about the way they exist in time and and if that if they are if you see those as uh, compositions through time or as um, different sort of installation altogether absolutely i see them as compositions through time yes going through through all sorts of subtle changes initially of course you you look for the changes in the sound and but you can always, and, and, and the uh, keys, of course, the hammers uh, are some of the first things to disentangle themselves from their mechanism, as it were. Um, but, there are, but you can always get sound from a piano, no matter in what condition. It's, it's absolute treasure, a uh, treasure hold of sound. So the sounds change over time, the sorts of sounds you can draw out of the instrument change over time, the shape of the instrument changes, it, it becomes part of its environment, which I love to watch. That's beautiful. It's sort of, it doesn't entirely disintegrate, it sort of transforms and, and becomes totally uh, appropriate to the environment. Uh, they're, they're definitely long-term pieces. But it is occurs that, to me that, yeah, go on. Is that a, a very a sort of important and meaningful uh, thing to you in in terms of your work in the way that the sounds of in this case the piano become a part of the natural environment oh yes 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 my i think i think a lot of my work with with the natural environment is focused on how do i become how do i really recognize how much a part of it i am how do i recognize how i'm not separate from it how do I really take that into my bones and my nerves and, and act accordingly? Mm. And that has been a sort of um, part of your work, even from the very beginning. You know, this the piano transplants are very are quite early works. But I wonder if this might be a good time to bring up um, the newer work uh, that's just been released on Onambachi's Black Truffle. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about the piece with Jan Wire called Into the Vanishing Point. And there yeah. is a particular environmental prompt for this piece that you have composed with uh, Jan Wire. So can you tell us about that? Oh, sure. Let me start by saying that working with Jan Wire has been one of the great experiences of my, my composing life, along with working with Nate Woolley on the uh, other piece on that record, Becoming Air. These have been, these two pieces are totally co-composed. Uh, I was not a composer, they were not performers, so to speak. We composed those pieces together and uh, it's been, it's been a, a wonderful experience to do that, to work that way. Um, Jan Wire, the piece with Jan Wire started with us, all 
having read an article, an alarming article in the New York uh, Times uh, magazine, Sunday magazine, about the disappearance, the ongoing disappearance of insect populations worldwide, sudden catastrophic failures and, and of insect populations. And of course, they're not at the base of a huge pyramid, but they are a significant part of a huge pyramid of intertwined, you know, existence and, and ongoing life, uh, which is going to collapse with them. Uh, and all of us being equally alarmed, uh, then I brought a sort of basic possible framework a sort of narrative framework with me to to our first couple of uh, rehearsals together and we uh, messed around with it, <laughs> chopped it, cut it up, <laughs> rearranged it and uh, used that uh, to guide the rest of our sessions together and and together put uh, created a vocabulary of sounds which could be used for the piece and shapes which we wanted to embed in it. This all sounds a little diffused, but uh, to be more specific, I asked each player to bring with them a little um, cluster of sounds which they love to work with, very soft sounds which they love to work with. Uh, and we took it from there. And it's, it's been a total joy. We're about to work more on it, in fact. I think, I think that origin for the for that for that piece um uh was i found very as a listener i found very suggestible because it meant that some of those percussive sounds you know i was hearing them as kind of mandibles and and sort yeah. of exoskeletons and things like that and i read other reviewers who didn't hear that in it at all which i think really interesting the way that sort of these conceptual ideas can filter through but i'm also interested in um how that relates to your experiences actually as someone who's uh, spent a lot of their professional life recording the natural world and if you have actually heard on an individual level um, the the depletion of insect populations in, in anywhere that you visited or record regularly? I, I wonder. I, I'm, what I'm noting now in my, my home environment is a depletion of birds, bird populations. I think it's real what I'm noticing. I think it's not seasonal. And along with that goes insect. I mean, it's intertwined with depletion of insect populations. Although I confess I find what we call uh, <laughs> colloquially stink bugs, which <laughs> because they smell terrible when you, when you kill them, which is a good reason not to kill them. <laughs> um, they're all over the place, but there's less of a variety of insects around my house now than they used to be and and it wouldn't you know the result the idea comes before the practice perhaps um, i was alarmed about this situation with insect populations before we started working together but having worked together on what we finally realized is a piece of mourning uh jan Ware and myself i now no longer just swat insects when i find them in the house i find i have to go and rescue them and release them outside there are not enough of you around so it's affecting my daily life which yeah i think that's sort of appropriate that relates back to the idea of what um you mentioned right at the start and what um we've talked about before is the way that sound can be a mechanism for uh, realizing your place in the natural world and increasing your awareness of that. I wonder if, there's, if that relates yes, to that as well. It's true. Practical yeah. action. <laughs> yeah, yes. but it was beautiful. So I want to ask you also there. about the uh, other piece on that record, um, the Becoming Air with Nate Woolley, which um, I saw a long time ago at Cafe Otto when we programmed it there. And then to hear it on record again after not hearing it since that performance was there. I found a really moving experience because it's such it's such a very uh, physical piece. So I want to, can you describe um, the process of uh, uh, composing that piece with Nate with Nate Woolley? Sure, uh, we hadn't met before he commissioned it, um, and the commission took me by surprise because I've never, uh, other than a very early trumpet trombone duet, I've never written for a trumpet other than an, as a part of an ensemble composition. 
So since it took me by surprise and seemed a challenge, it seemed a very good thing to do. Besides, I knew he was a terrific musician. Uh, I didn't know so much about him as a composer. He's, he is, of course, both the most interesting composer. So I did with Nate what I usually do in uh, writing for a particular uh, performer. I went to his place and asked him what sounds he's, he was exploring right then. Um, and they were wonderful sounds. And we, in, the, in the, that first meeting, we discovered that we both had a um, had much in common in the way we approach sound and, and view it. Um, and that both of us are fascinated by uh, creating sounds which then sort of slip your mechanical control, so to speak, and move in surprising directions uh, and un unroll in, in wonderful ways. So that became a core part of the piece. And from then on, I, I did as I did with Jan Wire, I took a, a sort of sketched out a possible structure, moving from one uh, range of sounds and type of sounds into another, one, each evolving out of the previous array of sounds, until we reach a point of intense feedback. Because I love what Nate does with feedback. I mean, it can be done, it can be used so beautifully and mag magnetically and magisterially, or it can be, you know, just a, a, a cliche. But the way Nate controls and creates with feedback is, is really stunning. So it, it moves into this flat out uh, sequence of feedback. And then you talk about how physical the piece is. And then it ends with Nate slowly. He's, his circular breathing uh, control is wonderful. Circular breathing and very slowly on, on the tone with which the piece began, in fact, raising the bell of the instrument up to the ceiling of the performing space. And we were, we premiered it in a, and rehearsed it in a very, very echoic space, uh, issue project room space in Brooklyn. So we were playing with the acoustics of that space. He raises the bell up and he is still projecting this wonderful long tone. And if you can imagine yourself stretching your neck and throat with your head tilted up to the ceiling and still singing, <laughs> then you have some idea of what a physical challenge that is. And it's lovely because he always, he always, of course, does it, but how it comes out, you know, how it's shaped is unpredictable and different each time and fascinates both of us to see what happens. Yeah, I think there's something, there's a couple of things I want to pick up on that actually. In uh, one of the things that I find so joyful about your work and talking to you about your work is this, the openness you have to the sort of unpredictability in sound and also openness to the way other people will sort of play with or encounter, uh, yeah, installations like the piano transplant. So in that way, I wonder, as perhaps a leading, a leading question, is, is whether you consider your uh, composition as, as a listening practice. And of course, like, I know uh, you, you had a long association with Pauline Oliveros and other people working in the kind of deep listening area. But um, yeah, do you consider your composition to be a sort of listening practice? Yes, I think I, all, I always have since I gave up trying to specify to musicians precisely what sound they should make and precisely how they should make it and discovered, of course, that that's uh, an illusion, right? <laughs> so, I mean, they have their own ways of making sound and uh, there are so many variables involved that that sort of precision, uh, oh, forget it. <laughs> yeah. I, ever since you... then, it's been listening practice. Yes, indeed. Before, that I've never no, I don't want to interrupt that. you, actually. I no, was just sure. going to ask when you, uh, when you gave that up and why? Was there a particular moment? Uh, Yes, really. I had been studying with Gottfried Michael Koenig in Germany, who's a wonderful teacher, and making a, a, a small um, piece for uh, making a setting of Kafka parables for baritone and small ensemble. And because I've, timbre has always been my big love, I was creating all sorts of possible timbres, timbre combinations. Um, and it was performed in London by um, superb performers 
uh, who could realize the most intricate scores and still the sounds didn't come uh, didn't were not the sounds I had imagined and I realized step back a bit and realized that my way of thinking about uh, organizing sound and giving them to live hands and minds was was off kilter um, and then I discovered and then I shifted into glass and glass taught me taught me to really listen and taught me and, and inculcated this love of unpredictability it became it, a piece of glass always becomes unpredictable at a certain point when its energy intensifies enough um, and, and from then on never went back to refined specific <laughs> you know composing of scores to my relief <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was a good shift good shift so yes, my work has been a listening practice ever since I started working with glass. It was the great teacher. And then Pauline and I met, had a lot in common, started exchanging ideas and, and so on. And Pauline introduced me to Ruth, who changed, transformed my life, Ruth Anderson, the composer, whom you have, whom you have beautifully uh, reintroduced to people, whose work you beautifully reintroduced with here. And everything shifted. Mm. Yeah, that's a perfect time to talk about uh, Ruth and your work and life, actually, because um, there is a release coming on Adrian Rue's label. Is that right? I'm not sure yes, if there's any right. information no, about it yet, but I think we can probably talk about it. We should talk about it because sure. everyone should know about it. So can you, yeah, can you tell in your own words about those, these two incredibly beautiful, intimate pieces that are on, on this record, the four Ruth and conversations and how they relate to each other? Sure. Uh, when we first met, Ruth was on sabbatical, which is why I ended up in, America to begin with, in New York. I was her sabbatical replacement. She was in New England. She'd rented a little cottage. She was chopping wood and making pieces, <laughs> so editing wood and editing sound at the same time, it occurs to me. Something in common there. And I was in New York, of course, working in her studio, teaching her courses and so on. And we fell in love very fast after our first meetings. And I would go off to New Hampshire uh, every weekend I possibly could and, and, and just that became a sort of home for me. In between times, we called each other on the phone, uh, sometimes as much as twice a day, of course, as one does, right? And uh, Ruth started uh, recording our calls, tapping a phone. And then at a certain point she told me, she might have told me right away, but I think perhaps she did a little bit of phone tapping before she told me. So when we got, we started living together. We had this body of exuberant uh, phone calls full of laughter, uh, which she had recorded. And we said to each other, we're going to play these when we get old. We got old and we didn't remember that they existed. <laughs> we had totally forgotten them. Um, and I, going through, after his died, I started assembling her archive and rediscovered the phone calls on cassette. Uh, and sent them to Maggie Payne to see what, who's magnificent at <laughs> everything, including recovering sound, what she could do with them. Um, she sent me back, did, she digitized them for me. She also amazingly digitized Ruth's Resolutions, uh, which is also uh, on that record. Um, in any case, so I got those back from Maggie and started listening to them. And, and one thing, and the one imperative after she died, other than assembling the archive in a way which would enable it to live, so to speak, was to go back to that little village in New Hampshire and record, do field recording in the environments where we'd hung out, where we'd gone swimming in the afternoons, you know, rafting on the ponds and so on. And she had... Uh, in that initial year, she had made a piece out of these phone calls, precisely what she had in mind. Uh, one of her super fast, super, uh, super clean editing pieces, like State of the Union message, uh, which she called Conversations. And it's hilarious. The whole middle of the piece, which is quite extended, is just us laughing back and forth. 
with other other segments of com little fragments of conversation in the first part and the third part interwoven with a, a, what sounds like an old just out of tune sufficiently out of tune barroom piano playing pop songs from the uh, early 30s and late 20s which she would have grown up with she she was born in 28 songs from her childhood uh, oh you beautiful doll and uh, won't you come home bill bailey and one other which she just loved she'd found a, an old recording of these just the right sort of uh off kilter performance of them and from all of this she assembled conversations and she assembled it as a private gift to me uh the next year i went to new zealand to see my mother i took it with me so i would have her with me in that form and just played it so often uh, came back and we forgot about those tapes, as I said. Then when she died and I rediscovered them and I needed to be back in that initial space of our first year together, um, then I put together For Ruth, which is a, is a response to her conversations, um, taking longer passages from the phone calls and interweaving them into into that sonic environment, that acoustic environment. It was an absolute necessary, an absolutely necessary in, in uh, embedding myself back in that world of myself in that world. Very helpful to do, um, and it's it answers her conversations. Mm. She never would have expected conversations to come out incidentally. <laughs> I um I wonder if there's um I want to ask you so those two pieces though you know they're so beautiful and there's such a lot of closeness in them and this gorgeous uh, sense of the contentment especially in the like you're saying the sections of conversations that are the both of you in in non-verbal ways sort of expressing this uh, love and affection through these kind of really contented sighs it's such a beautiful intimate listen but I I wondered if and you and you said like uh, making for Ruth felt like a very p necessary part of the process but I wonder if there was ever a question of for you about whether you had to think about whether you actually wanted to release it or not or whether it was kind of for you and Ruth I I think uh, I don't remember thinking that through i think i assume it, it well it was a commission i mean there was no question of releasing it of course it was going to be released counterflows uh alistair fielding's counter wonderful festival in glasgow counterflows commissioned the piece so it was going to be released online uh through their aegis which i was i was most grateful for and they were entirely uh, they they love the idea of releasing Ruth's conversations along with for Ruth, so that two pieces, the two bookend pieces bookending our lives together were heard in relation to each other. And uh, along with that, yes, I wanted them to come out on a on a recording on a in a more permanent form. So it all sort of just flowed naturally, thanks to Alistair and Fielding. I mean, I would have made the piece anyway. I had already started it when Alistair, when they both approached me with this idea. But it was wonderful that they, that they wanted, uh, wanted it and wanted to present it as they did. They presented the two pieces beautifully. I was uh, grateful, most grateful. Mm, I'm very grateful as well. Like I, th I. There's, I can't remember being quite so, I don't know if it's because I have somewhat of a personal connection to these recordings, but find them deep, like really incredibly moving and very, very emotional in, in, in their not uh, particularly sentimental pieces, but they contain Good. something which I find very moving. I do urge everyone to uh, have a look at them online. But um, maybe when we're talking about uh, Ruth and Pauline and things, um, the other series that's still, I think it's still ongoing, is the um, reinterpretations of women's work. There, there's a, this series is still uh, going on, I think, isn't it? Because it's over a long period. Um, but women's work was the publication 
uh, of uh, compositions and pieces by women that was republished by Primary Information a couple of years ago. But it's an incredibly important uh, publication, I think. So, yeah, can you tell us, yeah, tell us in your own words what it is and how it came about? Uh, women's work is something which Alison Knowles, wonderful artist, who many of you would know, uh, and I put together in the in the mid seventies. Uh, we were um, surrounded by by vibrant women artists in many media. Uh, Alison knew many many people as she always does, um, and I was beginning to encounter women artists in the states whose whose work I had uh, caught but whom I hadn't known before. And it was exciting and it was uh, a time of high female energy and feminist energy. And we thought these works should be out there. The people should be able to do them. We were interested in collecting, in getting the women together um, from Yvonne Rainier to, oh, Carol Lee, um, to, to, to Carol Weber, rather, excuse me, for example. Uh, getting getting the women together as a sort of collective um, and selecting works which anyone could do and presenting them as uh, scores, uh, as practical practical things, not art objects, but as as practical things, practical experiences that people could people could do. Um, it went out, we, we published a certain number, printed a certain number, distributed them to bookstores, friendly bookstores. All the women themselves distributed did their own sort of ad hoc distribu distribution. And eventually it sort of faded from awareness. It was fantastic when Irene Revel uh, rediscovered it and, and James Hoff and put out this perfect facsimile edition. Um, and then just let's see on Wednesday night past just past um, issue project room having commissioned uh, responses to all the pieces in or almost all the pieces in women's work continued to do this and commissioned a response to Ruth's text piece silent sound which is in the uh, second issue of women's work uh, from Savannah Harris, who's a stunning composer, performer. She works with drum set, but in a way I haven't heard before, with a sensitive, a beautiful sensitivity. So on Wednesday night, Savannah premiered her with a piece titled Within a Sound Truth, her response to Ruth's silent sound. And it was a very, it was a moving experience, a conversation between Savannah and Ruth, sort of flowing back and forth, and in itself, it was absolutely mesmerizing. It was beautiful, beautiful performance, beautiful piece. So that was pure joy. And with women's work is indeed continuing, which is lovely. What does it mean to you uh, for these pieces to be played again by kind of the next generation of uh, women composers? Uh, it seems the natural outcome, and but it it is also a visionary outcome. Uh, Zeb Greenfield has initiated it, and, and he and his team at Issue Project Room have been carrying it through. I think without Zeb, it would not have happened. Uh, and so those pieces are like have been like seeds, and they're sprouting more pieces, yet more pieces from other women all over the world, I mean, many, many different parts of the world are beginning to become involved with the project. So it's, uh, Zev's vision is, is a superbly supportive, uh, mm. you know, idea and practice. I think um, I interviewed you a while ago and I asked you like the worst question that anyone ever asks any musician, which is tell me what your work's about you know, in one, just in one sentence. Um, but you actually did have this incredibly articulate and beautiful sentence. You said that your work was about the transfer of energy, but um, thinking about, 
And I'd thought about this in terms of uh, various pieces of your work, but actually that's true of something like women's work as well. Do you say that still holds throughout everything? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Women's work is a very good example of transfer of energy. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, so the piano transplants get transferred to Mayan Sadka in uh -huh. Israel, who, who made a wonderful, beautiful piece of her own, for example, to quote one of many, many examples, but one that came to mind most immediately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I suppose um, uh, that perhaps also relates to the record on Black Truffle, because um, Specifically, I want to ask you a bit more about the um, collaborative uh, way of composing and uh, how you kind of came to that uh, and, and why it's important. So after you sort of stopped asking people for specific sounds in your works, uh, was there sort of a transition into um, working with people on developing a piece between you and, and uh, whoever you're working with? No, let me let me pause for a moment. After Glass Concert started me on a, a quite a long period of time in which I was working as a composer performer. Um, I liked performing, and uh, I could earn more, frankly, as a composer performer doing gigs than I could simply as a composer uh, working, living from royalties and commissions. So, but I, but it was fun. I love I love performing. So. For a long time, I was doing my own uh, perform, devising pieces which I could perform. Uh, and then people started asking, instrumentalists started asking me for pieces and specifically, and wonderfully Thomas Buckner, the baritone, um, asked me for a piece in the late 80s. His was one of the first requests for a piece outside my little realm of <laughs> composer performer scenario the scenario that scenario and I, I was fascinated by Tom's extended vocal techniques uh, his use of extended vocal techniques of his own devising uh, his attitude towards uh, music is so is so beautifully open completely open um, and I, we dived into it together and composed co-composed duende uh, which uh, in which Tom created a vocabulary of, of his EBT uh, sounds and, new, and, and kept devising new ones. And I created a, uh, an electroacoustic uh, environment to surround, with which to surround his voice. And it was such a satisfying experience. And from then on, um, every now and then I would, when somebody asked me for a piece, unless they specifically wanted a uh, a score uh, pre-composed placed in their hands, uh, I took this approach. I think but the origin of the approach is, it was an idea that struck me uh, fairly early on, that performers are so, have such superb ideas and ways of working with sound and are in themselves such such powerful, powerfully interesting people that why would you not want to bring, make an area in which, which was completely open to the personality and proclivities and loves of the performer so that the, you acknowledge how much of a piece comes from the performer's being and spirit. How pieces we don't we don't just put pieces in performers' hands and say do this do that and and. It's our piece. You will. You're the channel through which it comes into existence. It's it's a very collaborative process, and why not let that run? You know, why not run with that fully? The way the way people working in in jazz always have. Yeah. Uh, do you do you think of that in terms of being uh, because in there is a way of reading that which is almost, which is quite political in terms of it's it's anti hierarchical in terms of like composer performer and perhaps uh, do you ever think of that as part of a sort of feminist practice or is it more about the sound the the putting the sound first i don't think i 
I, I don't think it's a real dichotomy, perhaps. Mm. Um, yes, I, I've, I've sort of uh, resisted a bit the idea of the, the dominant composer and the subordinate performer. And definitely. I mean, that, that is unrealistic to my mind. It's totally unrealistic. It's not how things actually are. Um, and we, as women, we've been pushing against, back against dominance and, and subordinate, you know, status forever, right? It's uh, feminist, yes, because it's part of our daily experience and to some level or another. We've experienced it on and off through our lives. So, uh, yeah, they seem, it just seems to be that that's the terrain. That's mm. the reality of the terrain that we're working with. And uh, working with performers uh, who then who, who then rec you're recognizing as co-creators is pure joy. It's, mm. it's such a wonderful experience. It's such fun, you know, and it's always fascinating. So, yeah, yeah, I think so, um, I have a really clear memory. And I think this relates to something uh, that I also experience a lot with your work, which is this gorgeous sense of... Uh, of play and the, and the joy in almost the, not necessarily accidental, but your openness to the way sound can happen and unfold um, and the way people listen, but also the way people perform it. And um, yeah. when we did the your choir piece, um, Water in Memory at Cafe Otto, and, uh, and there's uh, certain prompts in it, but they're... Uh, they don't uh, dictate to the performers exactly how things should go. And I remember having quite a revelatory experience uh, being part of that and, and seeing how other people in the choir were interpreting the piece and, or, or, and deciding to sort of speak at various times and thinking, oh, I wonder if... And thinking, oh, I wonder if Anea is happy or if she thinks that that's the right way to go. And then looking around and seeing you <laughs> watching a rehearsal just with a massive smile on your face. And, <laughs> uh, and I wonder if you can speak to that idea of sort of joy and playfulness in your, that seems to come through in all of your recordings and which is <laughs> transferred to me as well as a listener and audience member. Oh, Jen, thank you. <laughs> thank, <laughs> no, thank you so you. much. <laughs> uh, I sometimes find it amazing that audiences feel induced sometimes, perhaps in a in a program of string quartets, for example, which I vividly remember experiencing as a kid. Um, audiences feel induced to sit there totally solemnly, and the music, I mean, it can be Haydn, for example, he's a great idea, he's a great example, uh, is full of little jokes and, and quirky twists and and giggles, so to speak. And we all sit there feeling, uh, we used to sit there feeling that we have to be completely po-faced, right? <laughs> Not move a muscle as a child. You couldn't you wouldn't dream of turning a page in the program, for example. <laughs> um, and that seemed to me counter to the experience of, of music and sound. The music is full of play. Um, so why would you not want to work off of that? And, and we do, we do. Mm. We, we just need to uh, recognize that we do that all the time. Mm. I, think there's, I think also there's something beautiful about uh, the way your pieces in, invite that in the audience. So people, I've noticed in a lot of them that people do feel able and invited to, you know, go and sort of touch something, you know, or have a go at playing it or... Uh, go and have a, you know, have their own personal way of encountering these sounds and your music and compositions, which I think is um, maybe seems obvious to you or natural, very natural to you as a composer, but which I think is an extremely precious quality in it, which I enjoy a lot. Um, it's it's not just me, I should say. It's very much part of our our um, acoustic culture, for example, by now. Mm. So Liz Phillips. Uh, with whom I'm working on an installation at the moment, does very subtle, beautiful, interactive work, which people in which, which invites people to play every time I've experienced it, for example. Uh, Trimpin is a great example of play in, in, in work. Uh, lots of us 
the, the Fluxus people were, were expert at it. <laughs> Succinct play, you might call it. <laughs> so it's always it's always present. Uh, the, the, the technique is to make audiences feel relaxed and safe enough to play. Mm. Yeah, on that note, I wonder if um, I'm gonna. I'm really keen to get some questions from the audience. Um, but I wonder if um, there's any advice you have to uh, younger or aspiring composers about uh, the sort of principles that have meant a lot to you, or the things that um, you have learned along the way. I suppose. Well, I think for me, a big one was learning to trust myself. Uh, which I think um, is really translates as learning to trust my intuition, uh, especially in the very early stages of beginning to create a piece when everything is tentative. Uh, uh, just letting go of any uh, self-critical basis for, for figuring out what ideas you want to hold on to and what ideas you can let go is crucial in that stage. And the other thing I used to do, which which turned out to be a lot of, I mean, which was always a lot of fun, was that I would go with the with my most extreme ideas because they they would take me into new territory where mm. I could really explore. So take yeah, take risks. Yeah, it's a good yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. I find that true of writing as well, for for yeah. sure. And. Yeah, not, it's very easy to doubt yourself. But I want to uh, make sure we have time for some questions because I think people might have... Yes, we have a hand up. There's a microphone, so I think you should be able to hear them, Ania. This is quite a personal question, which maybe is not of interest to anyone else in the room, but I don't think I'll have another chance to ask it. I actually grew up in Ingotstone uh, in Essex, oh, and yeah. I found out about the piano garden after reading, I think, Jennifer's article... Yes, yeah, so just to, can I, uh, just to give a bit of context, uh, the first piano garden was in Ingate Stone in Essex in England, which is where Anea lived for some time. And yes, continue. And I, I grew up there. My family house is there still, my parents' house. And I went back this summer and I'd read this article and I thought, I'm going to see if I can find this piano because my, my family house is actually opposite Station Lane where I think the piano garden was. And obviously I can't see it. I couldn't find it. And I want to know, is it still there? Uh, did it get moved? Did it get taken down? Do you know what happened to it? Yes, uh, which I somewhat mourn. I took up for uh, the States in 73, having been um, a tenant at, at the human house in Ingotstone uh, for several years at that point, and having uh, let the front garden become a little bit unkempt, um, I'm sure, and Pretty much as soon as I left, um, Mrs. Human decided she really wanted to restore the garden to its usual, uh, you know, proportions, let's say, and the pianos were removed. So when uh, Dominic Chanel decided to, to recreate Piano Garden in Northern Wales, I was overjoyed. I really wanted to see that process continue and continue through the years. Uh, but the pianos and ink stone disappeared. That's you know station lane then, obviously. Yeah, I, I just I've, I've never even seen any photos of it. I don't. I'd be interested to see. I don't know if there are any which exist. I, I had a little bit of a look, but it'd be interesting if you to go see on if there my are photos website, of what it was. Go on my website, yeah. anealockwood.com. There are photographs there, oh, and uh, if you don't, uh, if you would like to see a little more detail, uh, just contact me through my uh, through the address on the website and I'll send you some. I'd be happy to. Thank you, that's really nice. Um, also, uh, there is the, the Welsh piano garden that exists now. Yeah. You can go and see that. And I, I think I mentioned it right at the start, but um, Issue Project Rooms sort of did a stream uh, this week of all of the piano of a bunch of different piano transplants and there's uh, recordings and photographs from the Welsh garden is that that's right isn't it yes that's right yeah it looks it looks beautiful it looks just the way I'd always imagined a piano garden might look over yeah time. it's beautiful I think yeah, yeah so you can take a trip to the Welsh one and go and have a look at that um but yeah 
That's interesting. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for Anea? Okay, so, yeah, we're about on an hour, so I think it's about time we need to wrap up anyway. But I want to say, uh, actually, as a, just as a final question, actually, the, there is a note in the program about the piano burning that's going to close the festival, and the, perhaps the, uh, people's reading of it or it being a particularly maybe symbolic or meaningful event at the close for the first festival back after a pandemic. And I wonder if you'd thought about the way that the current situation might impact upon people's experience of it. You're asking me or the producers? Yeah. Yes, you. Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, no, because my instinct is not to try to read the piano burning in a, in the context of specific circumstances, but to, to leave it open so that people can read it however it is meaningful to them, in whatever way it's meaningful to them. And I think, yeah, I think I would really like to, to continue that way, just leaving it totally open so with the, with the sense that whatever you feel about it, however you interpret it and understand it, is is totally valid. It is is right. There is no wrong, except that I'm not demolishing Western culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was never my intention. But other than that, there's no wrong way to read it. <laughs> yes, I think that's a very generous. There's a lot of generosity in that from you as a composer, which I'm really grateful for, and I find very inspirational and reminds me uh, not to be reductive in my sort of thinking about things and experiences of things, which uh, is a really good thing for all of us, especially. Um, so I want to say a massive, massive thank you to Anea for tuning in uh, remotely to this uh, lovely TV-ish studio here. Thank you to everyone watching online, and thank you for your question about Essex. Um, and Anea, I will speak to you soon. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you, Jenna. One more thing. I would never think of you as being reductive. Look at your work on foghorns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that totally <laughs> disproves any such idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, thank Anea. You. Speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Jen. Wonderful to talk with you. And you too. <laughs>